Good morning to you all. Thank you for joining us this morning. We see some um, age-old uh, activists. Let's start now, get down to brass tacks, the Euratom Treaty, the European Community on Nuclear Energy, set up in 1957, virtually no changes over the last 60 years. Even when uh, debate was ongoing on the various treaties, we had one where there was a vote in France in 2005. But even then, there, was, there were no changes to Euratom, which originally brought to together six countries. Article 1 refers to nuclear energy, and uh, nuclear energy, the promotion thereof, is linked to peace. The time has come to revise this treaty. It really is a caricature of outdatedness, and I hope that this is programmed obsolescence, and I believe that this is something of a relic. It is completely anti-democratic. Parliament has no co-decision powers. There are an awful lot of treaties linked to the Euratom uh, Treaty, nuclear withdrawal, radio protection, management of nuclear waste, radioactive waste. And in all these areas, Parliament can only issue an opinion. Yesterday, we voted on the ITER or ITER tree, uh, program, and this is linked to Euratom, the Commission uh, decided not to even turn to the Parliament here. As you know, some two billion were scheduled for 2021 through to 2027. So it went uh, from five billion up to 20 billion. And Parliament's opinion was not even sought. An MEP had to call for an own initiative opinion on ITER so that we could at least debate the future of this programme. So when you look at the Euratom Treaty, it leaves us completely without rights, no rights for the European Parliament. This is crazy to my mind. We're heading in to the European Parliament elections and no one is talking about the Euratom Treaty. I believe that we need to repeal the Euratom Treaty. With that in mind, we asked an expert to come along, an expert in EU law, an expert in nuclear issues, uh, Duarte Fouquet, we've asked for an update on Euratom, an outline of uh, what could be withdrawn, what could be removed. Uh, Article uh, 1, for example, could be uh, removed. Uh, that's the one that deals with promoting nuclear energy. What could we put into a revised EU treaty research investment? Uh, that should be debated in the framework of the treaty on the European Union rather than the Euratom Treaty. And I mentioned the fact that this treaty is anti-democratic. Now, if tomorrow there were to be a nuclear accident, what are the radio protection no standards? Uh, well, these haven't been adopted in a democratic process. A number of countries, together with the European Commission, uh, started talking about standards, sweeping standards. Roland might talk about this. But citizens had no say whatsoever. So as you can see, there are conflicts of interest. The people that own nuclear energy are deciding on the policies. And then you look at the range of countries that have nuclear power stations, some 14 throughout Europe. Some of them were behind the uh, Euratom Treaty, but some have uh, withdrawn from nuclear energy. Uh, Germany, Italy, Belgium has decided to do so. So I think the time has come to discuss uh, nuclear energy to discuss this treaty. I'd like to thank all the associations involved, uh, Christine Hassion, for example, and Roland Desbordes. We've uh, worked together 
to come up with a number of tools and uh, studies. And so we're going to talk about uh, all this, ask for your viewpoint so that we can launch a major campaign to call for the repeal of the Euratom Treaty. I'd now like to hand over to Duarte Fouquet uh, to present a study financed uh, by the Greens. It is a legal study to analyse how we can uh, get out of the Euratom Treaty or improve it. Go ahead. Merci, Michel. Merci de m'avoir invité. Good morning. Thank you for inviting me this morning. It's a great pleasure for me to be talking about a corpse, Euratom, but what do we do with the body now? I think all of us agree in saying that we want to see the text of the Euratom Treaty disappear as quickly as possible. So why is it that we're talking about this now? We shouldn't forget that the title of the treaty and or more specific Article 1.3 or Article 1 in general refer to the need to promote nuclear power. And that provides the basis for the reasoning underpinning the European Commission's agreement in, to provide state aid to support the building of new reactors. The most notorious or famous example of this is Hinkley Point, but we could also cite the, hungry, the building of a hungry plant, SIPAC, which is also covered by Commission agreement. In Finland, the Commission ruled that the money granted wasn't state aid, but we'll come back to this. So in other words, what we're talking about here is not an outdated treaty which is no longer relevant with no consequences. That's not a fact. In many cases, countries can decide to abandon nuclear power but still have to comply with many provisions of this treaty. So we have to look back to efforts in the past to reform the treaty. In 2002-2003, the European Parliament set up a convention working on two European treaties, first of all Maastricht and today Lisbon, which presides over the work of the European Union. So back in 2002, the European Commission itself published a package. This was the Penelope package. It's difficult to find these days, but if you can get your hands on it, it's worth reading. So, in the document I wrote on this, the people who drew up the Penelope package suggested that Eurotom could be severely slimmed down. And they said, for example, in the European treaties, the Eurotom treaty could be deleted, and that would be a good start. Emissions rules, R rules, waste rules, and so on. Unfortunately, the position of Giscard d'Estaing and an unwillingness of France to open the debate on Eurotom meant that nothing happened. France was paralysed by all the propaganda being pumped out on Maastricht. That was a shame, but they're having another go now. So what needs to be done with Eurotom? The problem with Euratom is that it does include effective rules and guidelines which have now been underpinned by European Court of Justice case law. Rules, for example, on radiation tests, waste and safety and security. So we shouldn't just throw all that out. But those rules are based on Euratom. So we need a, a transitional period so as to enable us to find somewhere else to put those rules. Another part of the European treaty architecture. So, as far as I'm concerned, we need a reform process. Whatever you do with your atom, if your idea is to simply chuck it out, 
according to EU rules, this can only be done via a convention process, and at the end of that process, you have to get unanimous support from member states. So I think if we start with the objective of ditching it all, we won't get anything, won't gain anything. However, if we put forward proposals based on commission ideas floated in the past, Penelope and so on, we can then go through the treaty line by line. But I think there should be three main objectives. We have to change the title. I think the treaty should be renamed to be called the European Treaty for Protection Against Radiation, Nuclear Non-Proliferation and Civilian Responsibility. Subsequently, the various different articles, including Article 1, which states that it's the duty and primary objective of Euratom to promote a powerful or strong nuclear industry, and also, as I'm sure you remember, to improve the quality of life in Europe. So all of that can be ditched. In many other areas, such as research, we talk for transposition in European treaties. Perhaps we could include a sunset treaty, a sunset clause, a five or ten year sunset clause to ensure that those rules are phased out. At the same time, we must enforce rules on non proliferation. They do figure in the treaty, but they're not strong enough. And we have to view them as working in tandem with international treaties. As far as foreign affairs are concerned, all of that has to be addressed as well. And I think all of that can be put to our authorities with the proposal they put in the treaties. Under the current treaty, civil responsibility, I think we should adopt a homeopathic approach to this, a minimalist approach. Article 98 addresses this. It, there's a reference to liability, but given the accidents we've had with the nuclear industry, this reform process in Europe has to, pre has to create a treaty setting out civil liability, and this will go beyond the existing provisions of the Paris and Vienna Conventions or the Brussels Protocol. As you'll see in the document, current rules in Europe are confused. There's an annex which tries to explain who is responsible for certain areas of liability under whatever treaty. That's simply non-operational now. If we succeed in including non-proliferation and civil liability, we might actually be able to keep the treaty under its present form until we've tied up all the loose ends. So what remains to be seen is how France or Central and Eastern Europe, those countries which still have nuclear power, will, will actually respond to these reform proposals since once again we need unanimity. This is where we should perhaps try and adopt a carrot and stick approach. If we want to suggest all of this, at least for old power stations, of which there are about 200 in the European Union, which will need to be decommissioned soon. So when it came to the coal industry, the Commission promoted something called the Just Transition, and the Parliament should push for a similar approach here. So for these old, outdated nuclear power stations, we should uh, earmark structural, fun, structural funding so as to enable countries to decommission those plants. And if countries were then able to get funding for a new reactor which weren't covered by the treaty, that would have to be dealt with on a case-by-case -case basis. So if we're to be pragmatic, this would enable us to ensure that member states whose coalition agreements refer to abandoned nuclear power, Germany, for example, for the first time in history, 
a coalition pact between the CDU and the SPD commits the government to initiating a reform process of Eurotom. Luxembourg has now joined Germany. OK, the German minister is now perhaps dragging his heels. But we should put pressure on Germany. Luxembourg, Austria, those three countries have to trigger off this process. Obviously, we have to talk to President Macron. That's the only way perhaps to achieve any progress. Merci, justement, de préciser. Thank you for clarifying why we are taking this step, step now. There is an opportunity, a type of Brexit, if you like. Uh, all options are on the table. And then we have the coalition between Germany and Luxembourg, Austria too. This is on the agenda. So we need to go around countries such as France. We have national debate in France, and we do need to talk about the Euratom Treaty. I'd now like to give the floor to Roland Desbord. Thank you. For a long time, we have been uh, criticizing this treaty, and we've worked with uh, Michel Rivasi, talked about the various pieces of legislation that flow from Euratom. We have been leading the charge here for quite some time. Unfortunately, we realize that this is not a democratic treaty. So we can talk now about the strategy. But here we have an opportunity, as Michelle pointed out. We can call Euratom into a question. The planets are aligned. That is why when uh, Christine uh, got in touch with us um, last autumn to ask us whether we were ready, well, we said, well, we're not really ready, but we're certainly willing. We uh, have gone beyond our own borders, and I think the time has come to take action here. Now, let me remind you that Euratom is both within and outside Europe. It is ambiguous. We would argue in favor of abolition. Article 1 stipulates that nuclear power must be promoted. All other articles uh, serve one single purpose, uh, to help uh, promote nuclear energy. We hear all about invis investment, uh, uh, liability, responsibility, and management of nuclear waste. These are key tasks. We're talking about uh, nuclear energy for uh, military purposes, civilian purposes. Now, why is this industry not required to take out insurance policies? We have to, we are all required to do so, and we hear about civil liability, and I, I want to laugh, really. What happens if there's a nuclear accident? Uh, what sort of guarantees are there? to protect uh, people, to protect communities. We've discussed this together with Michelle and other MEPs. We've talked about all these uh, adverse uh, effects for nuclear uh, to be acceptable, and that is the whole point of uh, Euratom, for nuclear energy to be uh, economically viable, then people don't get the protection they need, and we have a scandalous system in place to manage nuclear clear waste, it is possible to release, free up uh, radioactive waste. And that was the case as of 96. If a nuclear accident were to take place, uh, limits uh, that are set for uh, traces in food are quite high so that we don't have to withdraw too uh, much food from the shelves. After 32 to 33 years after Chernobyl, what we see is that Europe has adopted a regulation that would, will apply to all countries, including those that uh, don't have nuclear power, and this regulation will require them to eat food with levels of Becquerel far higher than what we had when uh, Chernobyl took place.
we took action. Uh, we uh, took a case to the European Court of Justice. We have done everything within our power. It is unthinkable that we continue with this type of treaty that was drawn up at a time. I mean, when you read the texts that were drafted at the time in 57, your atom is uh, the child of Atom for Fils. And I mean, you have to smile when you uh, read all that it contains. And so, uh, as far as we're concerned, the strategy should be to ditch uh, your atom completely and it should all come under European common law. That is what we feel is most important. Christine has, you have the floor now. She is an activist. So what would your uh, reaction be? Good morning. Thank you for organizing this press conference. I hope that it will uh, give us a springboard. We are the human chain organization and we are involved with various other organizations, including Atomstop in Austria. In April 2017, an international conference was organized uh, against nuclear energy. A couple of months' work uh, was put into a resolution calling for repeal of Euratom. We uh, felt that this was a historic turning point uh, with Brexit, European Parliament elections, a real milestone. So we felt that it was important to take action. Euratom needs to be tackled and we need to move away from nuclear. Without subsidies, without loans, we firmly believe that there would be no future for nuclear power. As you have all said, and I don't want to repeat the points you've already made, there is a huge uh, uh, obstacle, and that is what nuclear energy constitutes, a barrier to the development of renewables. And a lot has changed since uh, 57. In 2000, the European uh, Council called for resiliation of Euratom, but the Atomic uh, Commission refused to, to go down that path. So this clearly demonstrates that it is not a democratic treaty. When uh, the decisions uh, are in the interest of nuclear energy, it's part of Europe. When uh, the decisions go against nuclear uh, industry, it's outside Europe. We have been in touch with various NGOs in Finland, Sweden. We were delighted to hear uh, positive noises from all those quarters. Other countries have told us that it is key for them to see movement in France. We launched a petition on the 13th of December. We have some 7,600 signatures. Same petition in Germany. In France, the petition will go to President Macron. In Germany, the petition will go to the Chancellor, Angela Merkel. They have some 40,000 signatures uh, gathered in a short space of time. That's uh, quite understandable. Germans see what they have to uh, pay, and uh, they have already taken the decision to move away from nuclear energy. Same in Luxembourg. A number of countries see the threat uh, that stems from uh, outdated nuclear power plants. In France, the situation is uh, somewhat different. People don't uh, feel all that uh, worried. They're not too concerned about the risks associated with nuclear. I think it comes down to the bottom line, money. Thankfully, we're now embarking on what you might call a tour of France. 
We have uh, two to three meetings scheduled throughout France to galvanize uh, grassroots, to pass on the information we have, and we've seen excellent debate. That's uh, all I want to say. I hope that uh, we can uh, teach and inform and that France uh, can uh, see things change. Any questions? Christine, coming back to what you said. I think the people of France are very much interested in the question of abandoning nuclear power. However, they were brought up and breastfed on uh, nuclear power and they continue to believe that nuclear power is cheaper and that only other countries have risky power stations where accidents might happen. However, I fully agree, disagree with what you said regarding the idea of having a nuclear Tour de France around the country to try to undermine support for Euratom. I don't think that'll change anything. For me, Euratom is a negation of democracy. If European parliamentarians want to be able to make their position clear on questions of topical importance, I'm simply unable to understand how it's possible that members of the European Parliament shouldn't be allowed to speak out on nuclear power, in particular given that nuclear power or accidents obviously know no borders. It's the most cross-border issue I can think of. And morally speaking, we simply don't have the right to leave nuclear policy making in the hands of a small group of experts, specialists from engineering schools uh, whose only interest is to continue promoting nuclear power. That's simply no longer possible. I agree with Roland de Boer. This treaty has to be ended. As long as the treaty continues to exist and we fiddle at the edges, we'll be on the wrong track. Nor should we forget that if it weren't for our neighbouring countries, France would go even further in promoting the nuclear industry. Thank God Luxembourg and Germany there who keep hammering on about the need to close Katanom, to close Fessenheim, to reduce the budget and so on. So thank goodness we've got these neighbours who are downwind from our power stations. We can no longer deny that serious accidents are possible. We had a serious accident in Japan. There's absolutely no reason why similar events shouldn't happen in Europe. I agree entirely. There are two things I'd like to say. So first of all, Christine talked about a petition. I would encourage all of you to ensure that this petition pro figures prominently on your websites. It's very important that this be widely distributed. My second point, as you know, EU elections, European Parliament elections are just around the corner. So I would appeal to all of you to get in touch with candidates, asking them whether they accept the fact that nuclear power be given uh, its own treaty, separate treatment. And would you accept being elected to the European Parliament without having co-decision on this energy-related issue of nuclear power? I was co-rapporteur on the nuclear union. So we worked on climate change, greenhouse gas, efficiency of existing methods and so on, but we couldn't talk about nuclear power. 
So since we're talking about the European Union with an energy market, investments, research and so on, everything in the Euratom Treaty should come under uh, standard EU law. So obviously we have to think about this upstream, and I, th I would thank you for this EU report. We have to bear in mind the question of civil responsibility, nuclear non-proliferation and so on. But it's important that your future representatives here in the European Parliament uh, make commitments on this. When we had commitments on popular consultation for the Maastricht Treaty, nobody talked about the Euratom Treaty in France. Why is it that Giscard d'Estaing managed to remove that from the scope of the Convention? But it's up to us to address that, and all of you have a role to play there. So you shouldn't say we're pro or contra nuclear. What we should be saying is that the Euratom Treaty is non-democratic. You can't sit in the European Parliament while accepting the existence of a treaty on which you have no say on the nuclear industry. So ensure that this be addressed in public debate. Draw attention to this issue. Why is it just people in the Greens who are talking about this? Uh, and I must say I'm pushing hard with the Greens to ensure we include this in our programme. If, if you don't know the Euratom Treaty, sign the petition and you find out a lot more about it. If I could just add, there's a website, Catanon Non Merci, which has a petition in German. You'll also find our position on the Kreirad and the human chain reaction. The speaker's microphone was cut off. I would add that the petition, Affaire du siècle, which has been signed by two million people in France, this petition calls, this calls for legal action against the French government because it's dragging its heels on taking action against climate change. Meanwhile, we're unable to get all those signatures for the against the nuclear industry. So you talked about the French. If we give f the French the chance to speak out, they will. Look at the gilets jaunes, the yellow vests. It wasn't just about the price of fuel. We should remember people's future if we have a nuclear accident. Everyone pays for this, and they're, they're talking about a lack of democracy, they want citizens' initiative, referendum, and so on. We're not even talking about a referendum, because we can't. So, I've been doing what I can, beavering away in my corner, perhaps you could do the same. Allez, dernière. Moyen juridique du Parlement européen. What about legal options? for the European Parliament to move away from the treaty and to reclaim responsibility for this issue. As I said earlier, the only option is to have a convention established. The European Parliament can call for such a procedure to be launched, can turn to Council and Commission to ask for this to happen, and perhaps that is an option, to issue such an appeal. There are member states that have asked me whether they can withdraw from the treaty on a unilateral basis, but that's perhaps a debate for another time. 30 seconds. Just very briefly. First of all, I would like to thank the four speakers, uh, and I know there are many more uh, working away behind the scenes. We are the oldest uh, anti-nuclear association in France, and I speak on behalf of many people, and I would also address the cross-border issue. I have a comment and a question. First of all, we have seen a wave of yellow vest movements, and we could call for repeal of Euratom. We're talking at the end of uh, the day about uh, making ends meet and making the world last. We need to talk about uh, renewables uh, and the uh, efficiency gains there could help people to make, earn a decent living. And I think perhaps if we were to withdraw from nuclear energy, it would help people to survive into the future. 
A couple of points. Uh, Roland talked about uh, civil liability. From time to time, I organize uh, meetings on communication, the nuclear lobby. I'm not going to go into the detail. I always have a slide at the very end with one figure. I say, let's play a game. The figure is the following, 91 million, some 91 billion. And this 91 billion is the type of compensation offered to EDF through to the 31st of December 2016. Thankfully, I mean, we're talking about a crazy figure. Question for Mrs. Fouquet. We met recently at the Bundestag in Germany. Could I ask a question in connection with Brexit? Is this a perhaps a way in, a way to take action here, and how? Very briefly, well, we don't know what will happen. Perhaps we'll find out a little more by this evening. The UK had to or would have to withdraw from Euratom. You can't be a member of Euratom without being a member of the EU. So we would need to consider what would happen with the UK thereafter. What would its status be? Would it join uh, on the same terms as Switzerland? But to that end, we need a reform of Euratom. So some sort of pragmatic cooperation would have to be decided upon and negotiated. But firstly, of course, that decision has to be taken and people are tearing their hair out over this. But if they're going to go down that path and if they're going to uh, make those changes, then perhaps they could use the opportunity to make further changes. Michel Rivasi, we have to leave the room.